After completing a few quests for Diane in the Red Rock Drug Lab yeah, of the Red Rock Canyon, time. she asks you to deliver a suspicious okay. package to the Raider Fiends at Vault 3. You up for something challenging? I've got a ship of Jet and Psycho that needs to be delivered to Motor Runner at Vault 3. Don't get cocky. The Fiends are twitchy. Most of them won't bother a con, but the ones outside the vault, well, they're outside for a reason. Here's the package. Good luck. Your payment will be waiting when you get back. Diane is a member of a tribe called the Great Khans. They do mercenary work from time to time, but they're not really raiders. They have a distinct culture and great tribal pride. They make a living by creating chems in their drug lab. They may not like it a whole lot, but one of their primary customers is a raider gang known as the Fiends. These Fiends are some of the most bloodthirsty raiders in all of the Mojave Wasteland. We may not be keen on delivering chems to these guys, but it does give us a convenient excuse to infiltrate Vault 3. Accepting Diane's proposal adds the quest Abba Dabba Honeymoon to your quest log. The name of this quest is a reference to the song sung by Debbie Reynolds in the movie Two Weeks with Love. The primary reason we're going to Vault 3 is because we've been sent there by Colonel James Shu of the New California Republic. When you ask the Colonel what some of the biggest challenges the NCR are facing, Honestly, we're fighting a lot of fires right now. The Fiends keep pressing their position from Vault 3. He of course mentions the Legion, but also mentions the Fiends. You can ask him to elaborate. As in Chem Fiends. Biggest gang of raiders I've ever seen. Nothing like addiction to swell your numbers. Psychotic and completely unpredictable. They set up shop in Vault 3 to the west. Every day they attack our positions and my men repel them. But every day there's more of them and less of us. I sent one of my rangers after their leader to try and destabilize them. He didn't return. Hell of a thing, losing a ranger. You come to depend on them, and they come through for you so often, you forget it can happen. That vault is a hornet's nest. If you have second thoughts, no one would think less of you for it. But if you can get him home, it'd mean a lot. Watch for civilians, too. The fiends have been kidnapping locals. They just walk right into people's homes in the middle of the day and take them. But the man you're looking for is Bryce Anders. Anders was trying to find the leader, Motor Runner. You hear something like a chainsaw? You found Motor Runner. Put a bullet in his head, and you'll have some new friends around here. Both quests send you to the South Vegas ruins. These ruins are fiend territory, and even if you walk around wearing the uniform of the Great Khans, the fiends in this area will still open fire on you. You have to fight your way through dozens of them before finally arriving at the door to Vault 3. This is what I've been waiting to see. A big bad con bringing in the medicine. How about you toss some psycho my way? Now you could reveal yourself and say that you're not a great con, but our goal is to gain a private audience with a motor runner. So instead, let's threaten this gatekeeper to keep up the ruse. Hey, no need. No need. I was just kidding. Motor runner's down in the maintenance wing. Straight through the door behind me, down the hall, down the stairs to the right. I was just kidding about tossing me some psycho, so you don't gotta say anything about that. We have a con coming through to see the boss. Don't shoot at her. Once past the gatekeeper, we can then wind our way through the twisting passages of Vault 3 in search of Motor Runner. Instead of going due west as instructed, we can turn south to go through a closed door. Here we find the corpse of a fiend on the ground. Well, this is strange. We haven't killed anybody yet. Next to this fiend is a landmine. It's starting to become clear exactly how this fiend died. This entire corridor is booby-trapped. We have to disarm a trip wire through the doorway connected to a fragmentation grenade bouquet, and then disarm yet another mine at the top of the stairs. Passing through the door and up the stairs, we can disarm two more fragmentation mines before we come face to face with Bryce Anders. He tells us a little bit more about what the fiends are doing here in Vault 3. This was Vault 3, but I'm sure you can tell that by all the threes all over the damn place. Now it's a drug den for the goddamn fiends. The fiends are degenerate drug addicts who kill and rape for fun, basically. They're human garbage. Though I'm not sure about the human part. The fiends killed everyone living here. Now they're squatting in their home. We can then tell him that we were sent by his colonel. 
Shu sent you? This was my mission. Now you have a number of options here, each with different outcomes. If you pass a tough speech check, you can convince Bryce to come with you to defeat Motor Runner. Or you can shame him for hiding up here nursing his wounds and egg him on to fight Motor Runner alone. But instead, what we're gonna do is tell Bryce that we can take care of it and send Bryce back to NCR headquarters to heal. I guess you have a point, and I don't know how long it'll be before I'm on both feet. Here, take this. It's the key to the maintenance wing. Should make getting a motor runner that much easier. Good luck. Once done, he opens a secret panel in the wall, which leads directly to the vault exit, the same door where we arrived. Apparently his stealth is really good. He sneaks past the guards without being seen. Now the key that he gave us opens up the maintenance wing, but since we're disguised as a great con, we really don't need it. So one task is down, we have three more to do. We need to make the chem delivery to Motor Runner, then we need to kill Motor Runner, and then we need to free any captives that we find here. Since we're disguised and the fiends are friendly, let's make use of the opportunity to explore the vault. As typical raiders, the fiends lounge around all day taking chems. We find a lot of graffiti all over the walls. Fiends marking their territory with their own name, like Jimmy is awesome. This one is scribbled out. Initials, SMD, RR, Marduk, 999, ZB, and Billy Rules. Passive aggressive messages, quit your whining, like I give a cow dookie. You suck! Keep out! Inexplicable messages like ghoul and loving it. What? I feel fine. And then romantic messages. Peace and love. S and J with a red heart. A name crossed out with the name Brett written on top of it. Lester Heart. And then a little cartoon of a man and a woman in love. It's likely that the fiends drew all of this, and not the original residents of this vault. The interesting thing is that a lot of this graffiti is kind of sentimental. There's a lot about love. Some of them even appear to be really childish. The graffiti almost seems out of place for such a ruthless, bloodthirsty raider gang like the fiends. It reminds me of something Corporal Betsy said back at the NHR headquarters. Legion fights to win, and they're smart. Hell of a lot smarter than these crazy fiends. But I don't feel bad about shooting Legion boys. Fiends, on the other hand, sometimes I get pangs of conscience. Not often, but sometimes. Some cute little junkie bitch, so fucked up she doesn't even know that she's the bad guy. And I've got a headshot her. Makes me think. My it's interesting that she would have such compassion for the fiends after everything that the fiends have done to her, but that's a topic for another video. At any rate, these fiends are murdering and raping people in the Mojave Wasteland they have to be dealt with. So even if they are completely drugged out of their minds, once they point a weapon at us, they die. But speaking of the original Vault residents, where are they? Well, the story of what happened to the original residents of Vault 3 is told in a variety of terminals that we find while exploring the Vault. And yet we have a mission to take care of. Let's take care of the mission and then I'll describe the story of the original residents of Vault 3 once the assassination is done. Exploring through the maintenance wing, we at last come face to face with Motor Runner and his two dogs. I wasn't expecting a resupply so soon. So you have anything from Red Rock Canyon to sell me? We can question Motor Runner to learn a little bit more about the previous vault dwellers. I guess it isn't a secret. Yeah, the residents of the vault are all dead. We killed them. Funny thing is, they just let us in. We didn't have to force the doors or anything. We needed some place to put down roots. I was having trouble keeping my people out of Westside. We can then deliver our package from Diane. About goddamn time. Tell the cons if they can't keep a steady supply, we'll find someone who can. When done, there is nothing left but to let him know that he's a marked man. <laughs> you? Take care of me? <laughs> you don't look half tough enough. Sounds good to me. And to the dogs, too. Dinner time, boys. Once Motor Runner and his dogs are dead, the gig is up. The fiends in this vault turn hostile and begin to attack. As we fight our way out of this vault, we can now talk a little bit about what Motor Runner said. And this is very strange. So Motor Runner and his gang of raiders killed the original inhabitants of this vault. This means that unlike all other vaults from Vault Tech, this one didn't have some strange experiment on its dwellers. 
In fact, Vault 3 was designed to be a control vault so that Vault Tech could compare the results from their other vaults that were performing experiments to a vault that was performing no experiments. Control vaults were designed to release their inhabitants back out above ground after 20 years. However, the residents of Vault 3, afraid of what might be above ground after the bombs dropped, decided to keep the doors locked for many more generations. So if the residents of Vault 3 were so afraid of what might be happening above ground that they kept the doors locked, what eventually happened to make them open the doors? Why did the fiends just walk in and take over, as Motor Runner told us? Well, we learned the story from reading the terminal entries in this vault. It all started when a water leak broke out in the vault. The maintenance man for Vault 3 was a man named Vincent Van Miller. Vincent had identified a small water leak in the vault pipes many weeks prior. However, what he thought was originally a minor problem turned into a serious one. Water ended up submerging an entire subsection of the vault. This water leak also affected their clean, drinkable water. It's possible that the vault sustained itself by pulling groundwater from the nearby bedrock. If their water supply somehow sprung a leak and got contaminated, that would explain why they had to start rationing their fresh water. He apologized to any of the vault residents who had been living in the affected areas. Those areas are now completely flooded and they had to move. Aside from this catastrophe, we'll learn a little bit more about Vincent's personal life, and it shines a light on what everyday life must have been like here in Vault 3. Vincent was set up on a date by one of his friends named William Mason with a girl in the vault named Jennifer Lawson. Vincent was a quiet, shy man. He wouldn't have had the guts to talk to Jennifer if his friend William hadn't convinced him to do it. William was originally the man tasked with fixing the water issue, but Vincent was so grateful after William convinced him to become more courageous and take Jennifer out on a date that Vincent volunteered to take over the water issue. We then find an intramail from Vincent to Jenny. He says that he had a really good time and he was glad to be able to get to know her better and then he asks her out for a date, possibly next week. Jennifer Jennifer responds with much enthusiasm. The date must have gone very well. And then she says, maybe next time we can have breakfast together at well. Not so subtly hinting that she's ready to take the relationship forward. Now, the water issue has become so severe that for the first time in nearly 200 years, the vault is considering opening its doors. One of the greatest proponents of this strategy is the current overseer of the vault, Lincoln Davis. After talking with Vincent and William, Lincoln realized that they do not have the supplies or know-how to fix the leak themselves. He says, quote, at this point, we have no alternative but to seek the parts that we need from outside the vault. He appoints a fellow vault dweller named Michelle Dalian to be in charge of a committee tasked with reaching out to whatever topside civilization might have evolved during their time underground. It's his hope that the residents of Vault 3 will be able to form lasting relationships with the outside world, much like how Vault 81 in Fallout 4 has successfully been able to maintain trade relationships with the Wastelanders of the Commonwealth. Now, to complicate this matter even further, the discovery of the water leak happened during a regularly scheduled election. Unlike many of the other vault Tech vaults where the Overseer was chosen by appointment from vault Tech or through some Machiavellian experimental scheme, the Overseer of Vault 3 was simply chosen via democratic process. They had a vote. Lincoln Davis had been the Overseer for a good long time, but it was election time and he had decided not to run again. However, he does have a friend named George Stout. He and George see eye to eye on many issues. One of these issues is the need for the vault dwellers to reach out to whatever civilization might exist above ground. Now, we don't know how long Lincoln had been the overseer of Vault 3, but apparently he was well-loved. After Lincoln officially endorsed George to be his successor, George sent Lincoln an email thanking him for the endorsement. He says, quote, You are so well-respected by the residents that I'm sure it will greatly increase my chances of following you to the big chair. It's here that we learn that political turmoil has reared its ugly head in Vault 3. The residents of the vault have split themselves into two camps. In one camp, we have George, Lincoln, Michelle, and everyone else who looks forward to reaching out to whatever civilization might exist above ground. These are likely people who are taking part in Michelle's external association committee. They're getting ready to shake hands with the tribes of the Mojave Wasteland. 
Thailand. The other side are the isolationists. The isolationists are afraid of what might be above ground. They have no idea what culture could have evolved over the past two centuries. The isolationists think that it is foolish and reckless to just open the doors to the wasteland hoping for the best. Much of what we just talked about we learn on George's personal terminal in his bedroom. We also find some personal messages on his terminal to his niece, Janet. Janet was just about to turn 16 years old. George sends her an intramel telling her how proud he is of her and how wonderful it's been to watch her grow from just a little toddler into the young adult that she has already become. But since we already know the fate of the vault dwellers here at Vault 3, all this does is further dark in our experience here. For now, we know that these fiends invaded and slaughtered all of the residents, including this poor 16-year-old girl. How many other kids did the fiends murder? How many infants and toddlers did they outright slay? Now, George is running for overseer, and he's clearly not an isolationist. The isolationists have put their own candidate forward for overseer. His name is Michael Robinson, and apparently Michael and George have been friends for a very long time. But when overseer Lincoln sent out his intramail, saying that everyone in the vault was going to have to open the door and go topside, that made Michael very nervous. And then when his friend George runs for overseer and gets endorsed by Lincoln, saying that he's going to carry on the mantle that Lincoln held, that made Michael very anxious. And so Michael decided to run as overseer for the isolationist faction of the dwellers against his friend George. He sends George an intramail saying, George, look, I know we've been friends for a while and I hope you don't take my candidacy for overseer personally, but I have to do what I need to do to keep our friends and family safe. You see, Michael is concerned about what's going to happen when they open the door. He proposes a slow exposure. He doesn't want to completely lock themselves away. He just wants to take things nice and slow. That is, to only go topside for things that they need. To not use this leaking water as an excuse to just fully expose themselves to the wasteland without first taking proper precautions, doing a little bit of research, sending out scouts. He says, quote, no one knows what it's going to be like out there. There could be mutants, strange wandering vagabonds, aliens, or murderous gangs. We have no idea. Let's be smart about this. It seems like a reasonable male. He's pleading with George. Let's take it slow. Let's figure out what's out there first before we just open the doors. Michael feels so passionately about this that many others fear that he may become violent. Michelle, the woman that Lincoln put in charge of the External Association Committee, sends George an email saying, look, George, I'm not sure what Michael is planning, but I suggest you leave the weapons in those two submerged storerooms. There's no need to give Michael the opportunity to arm himself. At last, we can understand why it was so easy for the fiends to take over Vault 3. Because they were afraid of what Michael would do if he had access to weapons, they purposefully kept all of the weapons submerged in the flooded rooms beneath the vault. That means that all of the vault dwellers were completely unarmed when the fiends found them. And at last, we learn the results of the election. George sends out an intramail to the entire vault saying, Thank you for putting your trust in me. I am honored to serve as your overseer. He then talks about how he can't wait to open the doors and greet the people of the wasteland. He promises, we'll get our water issues resolved and form lasting bonds with our neighbors in the world outside. Thanks for putting your trust in me, George. It's a great tragedy that this one vault that didn't have any crazy, horrible, inhumane experiments going on managed to last for generations safe and sound beneath the earth only to be completely destroyed and gutted the very moment they opened their doors. They were so hasty and foolish to open up their little community to the outside without taking proper precautions, allowing the fiends, a raider gang who had been hardened by decades of surviving in the wasteland, to just roll right over them. How must George have felt knowing that as his vault was falling to the fiends, that his policies were going to be responsible for the death and possibly worse of his 16 year old niece? How could he have made such a reckless gamble with her life? At length, we finally come upon some cages filled with three captives, Rick Lancer, Rachel, and Dennis. Hey, yeah, you, come give us a hand. We were part of a caravan heading into New Vegas from down south. They're holding us hostage, trying to get some ransom. Anyone willing to pay for us died in the attack. Once the fiends figure that out, we're as good as dead. I don't know much, 
only that the people who lived in here originally were killed by the fiends. Carter there escaped and managed to explore for a bit. He hacked a password off of the computer and found the location of some guns. He was on his way to get them when the fiends caught him again. Thanks, partner. I think the fiend with the key is back in one of the bedrooms somewhere. Someone called him Daniel, if that helps. We also find the body of a fourth captive, Carter. We learn that he managed to escape his cage and then search the vault for weapons, only to be discovered and killed by the fiends. Now before we can release these captives, we need to finish clearing the vault of all fiends. This can take quite some time, because there are dozens and dozens of fiends here. But once done, you can come back to the cages to release the captives. Take down this password. It'll get you into the Overseer's area upstairs, I think. Thanks for the help. We'll find our own way out. This password is actually for the terminal inside the Overseer's office. Using this terminal, we can unlock the doors to the weapon lockers that are found in the submerged rooms that we read about in the terminal entries. There are two small wings to this vault that are submerged underwater, each of which are locked and require high levels of lockpicking to unlock unless you activate this unlock functionality from the Overseer's terminal. But even once that is done, you're gonna die from drowning unless you either have a rebreather or you use Turbo. Turbo is a chem that slows time, similar to how Psycho is used in Fallout 4. Only the effect duration is really short. I believe it's only 3.5 seconds or so. However, it is possible to chain your Turbo usage to slow time down enough to unlock the door and loot the contents of the room before drowning. This is a whole lot easier if you have a rebreather, but if you don't, Turbo will work. Both of these rooms have good but not spectacular loot. You'll find a number of weapons you can use to repair the weapons you already have, and stacks of temporary skill magazine buffs. As for the good loot of this vault, you can find a copy of Chinese Army Special Ops Training Manual on a bookshelf in the first residential room that you see upon entering the residential wing of the vault. This book permanently gives you plus three to sneak. You can find a Sunset Sarsaparilla Star bottle cap on a desk inside one of the residential rooms on the bottom floor of the residential wing, one floor up from the flooded chambers. This is in the room with the terminal that says, Hello, Billy Boy, when you access it. You can loot a whole bunch of vault suits. These are going to be important to turn into Sarah for the quest Suits You Sarah. And on the corpse of Motor Runner himself, you can find a chainsaw, which is a pretty powerful melee weapon. Now that the vault is fully explored, and Motor Runner is dead, and the fiends have been exterminated, and the captives have all been rescued. You can head back to the Great Cons to turn in the quest, Abba Dabba Honeymoon. And you didn't even get skinned alive. I'm impressed. Here's your payment. And then back to James Shue at Camp McCarran to let him know that you rescued Anders and the captives. Unbelievable. That man has given us so much grief since we set up here. This may be a major turning point for us. I can't tell you how many times we thought we'd taken him out, only to have him show up again later, taking more heads off of fallen troopers. This is for the bounty. And this is from a pool me and a lot of the soldiers around the base had going. You may not be in CR, but hey, it's only fair. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the full story of Vault 3 in Fallout New Vegas. What do you think of Fallout New Vegas? There are a whole bunch of really interesting vaults in Fallout New Vegas, and I'm considering doing videos on all of them. But I'd love to know what you have to think. Are you interested in learning more about the vaults and other places in Fallout New Vegas? Or would you prefer that I just stick to Fallout 4? Let me know in the comments section below. I read all of your comments, and I use your comments as inspiration for my future videos. If you liked what you saw, be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell button to get notified the next time I publish a Fallout New Vegas lore video. And if you're a fan of Fallout 4, you should check out my Oxhorn t-shirt shop. I've got a bunch of Oxhorn and Fallout 4 inspired t-shirts for sale there, as well as cups and hoodies and other cool stuff. And if you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. Patreon subscribers get access to a private channel on my Discord server, as well as a bunch of other cool Oxhorn perks. But more than anything, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just so glad that you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow morning bright and early with a brand new video. No!